to rise in body or in spirit to join me in reading responsively our call to worship. Our call to worship today comes from Psalm 133. Let us read it responsively. How good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like the dew of Hermon flowing down upon the hills of Zion. From there the Lord has commanded the blessing. As children of God, we know that we have, we have erred. We know that we walk in paths 
that are not righteous, paths that are small, paths that are weak, paths that keep us from those whom we love. And as children of God, we are bold to ask for God's forgiveness. We are bold to ask for God's grace. Please join with me in asking for that grace together. Merciful God, we confess that we do not always love you with our whole heart. We confess that we often feel overwhelmed by the complex and broken world in which we live. We confess that there are times when we walk away from friends who are hurting, neighbors in need. In your loving kindness, O oh God, forgive us, we pray. Let us find strength and compassion and communion with you and community with each other. We pray with gratitude for your grace. We pray with gratitude for your grace. As children of God, we know that our sins are forgiven in Christ. Our sins are as far from us as the East is from the West. And when God looks at us, God sees love. Beloved, be assured knowing that your sins are forgiven in Christ. Amen. peace, we're told in scripture, is a gift from the Holy Spirit. A gift that we don't need to earn, a gift that can come to us at the most unexpected time. It is Christ's peace that allows us to go from stranger to friend, from acquaintance to friends of our hearts. May that peace fill your lives. May the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Beloved, welcome to worship this morning at Central Presbyterian Church. We are delighted you are with us today. Whether you're here with us in the sanctuary or joining us online or on TV, we are just very glad that you're a part of the worshiping community for this service. Um, today is our fifth Sunday in Lent, and we are finishing the sermon series on leaning into holy. We've uh, le We've explored leaning into holy through prayer, creation, songs, sacred readings, and today we're exploring leading into the holy through friends. 
Uh, following this service, I'd like to just give you a tip, and that is, I, if I were you, I would go directly to the glass hallway where the youth group is, uh, has a wonderful bake sale um, for their mission trip, and there's some really good looking things out there. So please go, and then after that, go on to the auditorium for take 10, have some time for conversation. The morning's not done. When you've gone to take 10, come across the hall to the fellowship room, and I'm gonna give a little overview about the interim process, half an hour or so, answer any questions. We'd love for you to understand what the process is and where we are in the process and would love your support and your interest. So come on over. Um, then the day's not done. Come back at five today for wave worship in the auditorium. There'll be fabulous music and food. And um, I'm gonna do something, uh, a little reflection on St. Patrick's today, so please come back. Next week is Palm Sunday, and we begin Holy Week. There's some information in Life at Central. We especially love parents to know if your kids would like to per participate in the Palm Sunday processional next week. We invite you to meet ahead of time, and also there's information if, you, if the kids would like to sing in the choir. Uh, there's a rehearsal today. So please come next Sunday. Join in the processional of Palm Sunday. S plan to stay for the Easter egg hunt. I understand the Easter bunny is going to be there, so that should be a draw. And then um, following the Easter egg hunt, there's going to be a fabulous breakfast that people have prepared for you. So come back, and then we enter into Holy Week. We invite you to take note of the Monday Thursday service, the Good Friday service, and then, of course, we'll celebrate together on Easter Sunday. Um, I just want to say one more thing, uh, that today is the last day if you would like to uh, contribute a donation to flowers or music for Easter, you'll also find information about that in your worship materials. So again, we're really glad that you're here with us today. you're my last chance of the day. I spend my night on knees before you. Put me on your salvation agenda. Take note of the trouble I'm in. You have turned my friends against me and made me horrible to them. I'm caught in a maze and I can't find my way out. Blinded by tears of pain and frustration. But I'm standing my ground, God. I'm shouting for help. At my prayers every morning and on my knees every day break. For as long as I remember, I've been hurting. I've taken the worst you can hand out, and I've had it. You made lover and neighbor alike dump me. The only friend I have left is darkness. then, 
when they said, Let us go to the house of God. My heart leaped for joy. And now we're here, O Jerusalem, inside your walls. Jerusalem, a well-built city, built as a place for worship, a city to which the tribes ascend. All God's tribes go to worship. So for the sake of my family and friends, I will say, live in peace. For the sake of the house of God, God, I will do my best for you. Let us pray. O oh, Holy One, we thank you for this opportunity to gather in the embrace of this sacred space. We ask now that somehow through your spirit, you meet us in this moment and in this message. May we be open to what you desire us to see and know and understand about you and one another, and ourselves. We pray with anticipation in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. As most of you know, I had the privilege of serving as minister of the chapel at Princeton Theological Seminary for 15 years. And over those years, I frequently heard stories how students came to the seminary in response to God's call in their lives. Though the shape of that call varied from student to student, the call was often deeply rooted in a passionate and transformative experience of God. That call was often deeply rooted in a profound connection with a community, be it a church, or a college fellowship group, or a mission team. The students came loving Jesus. Like the scripture text for the first sermon in this Lenten series from Psalm 116, which begins with that profound statement of faith, I love the Lord. Now students arrived eager each fall, a little bit anxious too, but they usually thrived at orientation. Then classes began. You see, in classes, students were asked to take their heart faith and put it in their head so that they could study. Seminary is an academic institution. It's a graduate school of theological education. 
and it's demanding. Some of you may able, be able to resonate, re resonate with this experience in your own vocation, or when you started a job in a chosen field, or when you started a family. It's that thing where you think you know how it will be, but as Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann calls it, we can experience disorientation when we begin something new or something that's challenging. That's what frequently happened to the students their first semester at the seminary. And responding to the rigorous academic demands, they began to feel isolated and alone. And over those 15 years, I had many conversations and shared many prayers with these first year students, knowing that the disorientation would evolve to reorientation, but it just takes time. But there was one particular year. I had this conversation about loneliness and isolation with a number of students in fairly quick succession. I also had a senior student, Daniel, come into my office, and he was concerned about some of the first year students he had spoken with. So at the beginning of the spring semester, Daniel and I invited five first year students to join us for lunch. We talked about the isolation, we talked about the alienation that they felt when they started. We all agreed that the following week, these five students would invite five other first year students, we'd gather for lunch and try to figure out how we could respond. Now I'll be honest with you, when we said that we really had no idea what that meant. But early Sunday morning, before our next lunchtime engagement, I was driving to guest preach at a church in North Jersey. And at that time, on early on Sunday mornings, there was a radio show called On Being with Krista Tippett. Some of you may remember this show, which explored all types of faith and spiritualities. That particular week, Krista Tippett played a recording of an interview that she had done with an Irish poet, author, and former priest, John O'Donohue. John O'Donohue was a native Irish speaker, and he was an expert in Celtic spirituality. I would like to say, just as an aside, that I'm very glad we can lift John O'Donohue's name on St. Patrick's Day. What was so interesting about this particular interview was that it was about the importance of spiritual friendships in our lives. The Gaelic word for spiritual friendship is anam kara. It's a, it means soul friends, spiritual friends. These friendships are like a triangle. There are two people in the friendship, and then there's God. So this whole thing turned even a little more toward the holy the following morning when Daniel came into my office and he said to me, Jan, have you ever heard of Anam Kara? And he did not hear the radio show. We pretty much took this as a message from God. So when we gathered these 10 new students for lunch, we figured out a very simple plan where returning students would volunteer to be matched for new students for the first six weeks of the semester, and the commitment was to have a meal together and pray together. We had this proposal, but we had no idea how anyone in the community would really receive it. So we set up a table outside the lunchroom, and we had 75 returning students sign up to be matched with a new student. The Anamkara ministry had started and it still goes strong today. Anamkara, I believe we all need spiritual friends, soul friends, to navigate our journey. In her book, Soul Feast, Marjorie Thompson refers to these friends as companions on the journey. And she says these companions listen, they ask good questions, they hold our lives in confidence. They help us notice things. They help us respond to life with greater freedom. They help us explore spiritual 
practices and other possibilities in our lives. I love what Eugene Peterson wrote about his spiritual companion, his Anamkara. He said, I felt a large roominess in his company, a spiritual roominess, room to move around, room to be free. Now for those among us here today who are extroverted, this is good news because spiritual friendships may be one of the most life-giving spiritual practices that you can have. During one of my first semesters at the seminary, I heard a professor say something that changed the way I approach conversations about spiritual formation. This professor said, I am extremely extroverted. And I'll be honest and say that when I go on a retreat and the leader asks me to go off for an hour by myself to read scripture or reflect on questions, she said, I wither. But she said, if that leader paired me up with someone and told me to go out and talk about a piece of scripture or spiritual questions, I thrive, I'm alive. She said, I'm an external processor. I thrive when in conversation with others. Wherever you are, that's a good thing to know about yourself. And wherever you are, I believe we all need spiritual friends. Anamkara is essential for our health and well-being. In May of 2023, the Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murthy, released an advisory report about the devastating health impact of isolation and loneliness. This report resonated in a post-pandemic world. This report resonated in a, com com in a complex and challenging world. And this report resonated in an often unkind and harsh world. A world where more and more individuals can feel despair like the despair we read about in Psalm 88. You may remember that two Sundays ago, we read the first part of Psalm 142, and it had three movements. There was a desperate situation. Then there was the psalmist's response to the desperate situation. But then there was a turn toward hope. There was a reassurance that at night, God's song is with us. But in Psalm 88, the psalmist has not only approached the rim of despair, the psalmist has tumbled in. This time, Walter Brueggemann writes, when God doesn't show up and there's no sign of his presence, the psalmist holds God's feet to the fire. An unanswered plea doesn't silence the speaker. It leads to more intense petitions. The psalmist is angry. As we have said all along through these five weeks of leaning into the Psalms, the Psalms, these 150 pieces of Psalms, are the songbook of the Jewish people. They cover all the realities of life. And there are some Psalms that are just honest about loneliness and isolation and frustration and anger. But what a relief to someone who feels that they are in that place. But beloved, this is not the end of the Psalms. Today we also turn the pages to Psalm 122. This is one of what we call the Psalms of Ascents. Psalm 120 through Psalm 134. Many scholars believe these psalms of ascents were sung on spiritual pilgrimages. The believers often traveled to Jerusalem for the holy days, and when they arrived in the city, they ascended up the mountain to the temple where they would worship with other believers in God. A matter of fact, next week is Palm Sunday, and Jesus and his disciples go to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. It could be very likely that this next week, Jesus and his disciples traveled to Jerusalem and very likely that they sang this psalm. One of the beautiful parts of the psalm is the joy that is felt when the psalmist approaches the temple. 
their holy place of worship. In our passage, we read the translation that said, when they said, let's go to the house of God, my heart leaped for joy. My heart leaped for joy. This is where the psalmist found their tribe, their fellow believers, their holy friends. I believe that this is an essential element of the faith community. I believe it's one of the essential elements of this faith community. For over 150 years, Central Presbyterian Church has stood on this corner. And there have been many great sermons preached. There have been many passionate prayers offered by pastors and from the pews. There have been fabulous songs sung and inspiring anthems offered. There have been baptisms and weddings and funerals. And there have been youth groups and Sunday schools and study groups and prayer groups. Love and grace has been given to people in need in these walls and without of the, outside of these walls. But equally important, and I believe equally essential, is that this has been a place where people can come to multiply their joys and to divide their sorrows and not be alone. Since I've been back with you, it's now six weeks, six weeks, so much here has touched my heart. The commitment of the staff and lay leaders, the worship, the music, the gatherings, the mission, many conversations I've had with you. But what equally touches my heart is when I've gone to visit some members who can no longer get to church. I'm touched how connected they still feel with this place not only through TV and online worship, but through so many of you who quietly but faithfully call people, check in, stop by, offer prayers. Since I've been back, I've had shared conversations with parents whose children I baptized 25, 26, 27, and more years ago. And those parents reflect back now how important it was to raise their kids here and how important this place can be to families. I've heard how this community has held people in times of struggle and illness, how you've navigated a season where you couldn't be together and then you had to figure out community all over again. Like all community, this is not a perfect place, but there's no perfect place. But the thing that I realized, what I realized 25 years ago, as, it, as this place has a great heart. And what beats at the heart of this community is spiritual friends, Anamkara, in a rapidly changing and complex, and as I said before, often harsh world, a world where everyone says the church is changing, I believe that that's one of the things that gives the church purpose and mission and passion in this day. We have to hold on to each other and have a place where we can multiply our joys and divide our sorrows and be at peace. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Beloved, let us pray. O good and gracious God, our guardian, guide, and friend, you indeed hem us in behind and before. You hem us in from beneath and above. We are surrounded and held in your everlasting arms of grace. For this we give our thanks and praise. O tender God, in deep gratitude for all we have been given, may we in turn reach out to embrace our loved ones and neighbors and friends. May those whom we encounter day to day see Christ in our eyes and hear Christ in our voice and feel Christ in our hearts. O loving God, we can often feel pressed down by the weight of this world. There's much uncertainty and instability. There seems to be so much hate and violence and fear. We ask that you help hold the weight of this world from our shoulders so that we may do what we can to live in love and kindness. Help us to find ways to extend help and to give hope. O oh, Creator God, we look at so many places around our globe where there is war and winds of war, Ukraine and Israel and Gaza and Haiti and so many more places. We lift to you the leaders of this world that they may have wisdom and compassion we lift to you the peacemakers of this world, knowing they need an extra measure of strength and guidance for the living of these days. May we be bold enough to pray for miracles in these troubled places. And transforming God, we thank you for your church, whose arms reach around this globe. We thank you for this church that has stood here on Maple Street in this community for over 150 years. As we continue to navigate this season of change, may we do so with love and joy, gratitude and hope. May we continue to seek your guidance, be your living word, and sing songs into an often song-starved world. O oh God, we thank you that we may lean on you and one another in this and in all seasons of life. We now gather all the prayers of our hearts, both spoken and unspoken, and we lift them to you in the prayer you taught us. Our Father, Lord, in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. show our community that turn to hope. The way that you serve, support, and care, and sing songs. The way that you lift up. Thank you. Thank you for being this church on the corner of Maple and Morris, and thank you for bringing church with you wherever you go. Thank you for offering care and comfort and sharing your gifts. As our ushers bring the offering forward, as our deacons ask us all to share our time, our talents, and our treasure, we invite you to ask the question, loving and gracious God, how might I serve you today? Amen.
Beloved, we go now into this day and into this week, knowing that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is with us now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.